John Malkovich, thank you for coming here to my home, the vice presidential suite yes. at, the, at the Marriott in Brooklyn. Um, soon to be presidential suite, I assume. One can only hope. Yes. I wonder, we're going to talk about this film being John Malkovich, which you know very well. And I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about your experience when you first learned about the project, how you first learned about it, and what it felt like to receive a script that said being John Malkovich on it. Well, I was shooting a film in Los Angeles called Mulholland Falls, and I was getting ready to go back to Europe either that night or the next morning or something, and I was out of books, and or nearly out of books, and, and slightly panicked about what I would read on the airplane on that super long flight back from Los Angeles, and I called my producing partner, Russ Smith, who's... who's my, one of my oldest friends and I said is there anything at the office for me to read and he, he kind of said in a kind of menacing way I've got something for you to read yeah and he sent it out with a, a messenger to the set we we're shooting out in the valley somewhere and I saw the title and I didn't really think much about it I think Oh, oh, over a period of time, two or three times a, a novelist or, or somebody had sent me something to OK, which mentioned my name or something about me or something. That, of course, I'm not, I don't really care what people say, so I didn't really think about it very much. And I started to read Charlie's screenplay, and after about 30, 40 pages, I called Russ back and I said, did you read this thing? And he said, yeah, I read it. And I said, but it, it, and it's a fantastic piece of writing. And he goes, yeah, keep reading. <laughs> and then, then I, I, I was back to work and took off, so I read it on the plane because the part I had read had nothing to do with me. So I actually thought it would be, as I mentioned, kind of like these other books or... Maybe an homage some, or some... Well, just so where somebody mentions your name or something, and they want to clear this or that, or, you know, I think one was like a short story, and I, I can't remember. But at any rate, I didn't really think about it at all. And then when I read it, I thought it was a fantastic piece of writing. And I called Russ that next night in Europe uh, in his morning going into L.A. and to the office and said, you know, let's see if we can meet this guy and tell him I would like to direct it and if you're okay with it, which Russ had kind of mixed feelings, but if you're okay with it, that we'd like to produce it. So Russ met with Charlie and Charlie apparently said he wasn't at all interested because we said if you'll change who it's about and make it about somebody else, I would love to direct it and we'd love to produce it. And Charlie said he just wasn't interested in that and he wouldn't change it at all. And Russ said, okay, well, then we're, we're not going to do it, but... but you know, thanks and good luck. And then eventually, in France, one day when I was walking the kids down to school um, in the little village, I got a call from Francis Coppola asking me if I would go to Paris and meet this this boy called Spike Jones. And I remember Francis saying that in his opinion, we'd all be working for him someday, and uh, w which I thought was quite a strong recommendation. And I went up and I met Spike, who I found hilarious, very sh sharp and super charming and stuff like that, but I just never thought anybody would do it. And I basically said, listen, I don't wouldn't really be involved except as an actor, but if you get the money and get it together and somebody's demented enough to do it. I mean, call me and I'll, I'll, I'll see, you know. Um, then some time passed and eventually I met Charlie Kaufman, the writer, 
but I remember having read it again to prepare for the meeting. And it seemed like kind of the worst jokes about me were cut, oh. um, meaning the kind of cruelest ones. And I said, you know, I, I like those jokes, actually. I mean, I think they were really funny. And, and mostly what I remember about the meeting is afterwards, Charlie said, you know, I just want you to know I'm a really big fan. And I said, Charlie, you know, I, we don't have to do that. I mean, I read the script, so, you know, it's pretty easy to take away your feelings about me. <laughs> and I, I wouldn't really classify them under the title fan. It was hard for me to get involved beyond a certain level because it's, quote, something about me, when of course it isn't at all about me, it's about people's perceptions of me, which of course I can't address and don't really know anything about. Which, in the, when you read the script for the first time, and I mean, it is a script that is very cruel to you. The story is very sure, cruel to your character. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you finally found the part in the script where you realize, oh, this is not someone talking about John Malkovich as an ideal, this is about me being home invaded in my head. How much did you feel that Charlie had gotten right and how far off was he? Well, I thought it was a, a fantastic piece of fiction. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was very obvious that Charlie had a unique, singular, quite, quite cruel, but hilarious voice. And to me, I thought it was probably the most original screenplay I'd ever read, maybe. The Broadhurst Theater, please. Hey, say, so, uh, ain't you that actor guy? Yes. Yeah, John, uh, what is, uh, John, uh, uh, ah, don't tell me, uh, Maplethorpe? Malkovich. Malkovich. Of course, I had to go through a period of time where I say, do I really want to do a film with my name in the title? And would that, how would that change my life or impact my life? Because my feeling was I'd always had an incredibly charmed life, and it basically also always been left alone. Well, and that's what made the movie so curious. I remember when it first came out, which was, of course, you had a reputation as an extremely well-respected actor and, and, and a well-known actor to some mm. degree, but not a super-duper worldwide celebrity. Not at all, no. That you would imagine, and that's what made mm. it such an interesting choice, because it was clearly a choice of kind of obsession. You know, an aspiring screenwriter today, an ambitious screenwriter today, might have written 10 versions of the script with 10 yeah. different personalities just to try to get one made. Sure, of course, But he yeah. refused to, to make it with anybody yeah. else. Yeah, I mean, Charlie, too, you know, these are, these two are very steely and very savvy, cagey characters. Mm -hmm. You know, they did what they want, which they have a tendency to do. I, mean, I literally, I feel like I'm going crazy, Charlie. I'm sure you're not going crazy. You don't understand, man. It's like nothing yeah, I've yeah, ever yeah, felt. Yeah, yeah, yada, yada, yada. The thing I remember most about the whole process of putting it together, especially in terms of casting, was he originally it was written for Kevin Bacon as my best friend. But Kevin didn't want to do it. And then we talked a lot about who it should be and et cetera. And eventually, I was always very firmly of the mind that it should be Charlie Sheen, mm -hmm. uh, who struck me as the person I would go to in a kind of existential crisis. Um, Again, uh, someone you already knew and... N or, never met him in my life. So it was more of a platonic ideal of a best friend that you had. Yeah, well, it just seemed to me to make sense because, you know, there is a part at a certain point where my character is talking about this coven of lesbian witches. He's quite tortured about it and quite 
upset and, and dazed and confused. And Charlie Sheen's character just simply says, you know, this coven of lesbian witches, and he's just having a bagel, and he's just like, hey, man, give me their number when you're through with them. <laughs> that is hot. Maybe she's using you to, to channel some dead lesbian lover. Sounds like my kind of gal. Let me know when you're done with her, yeah? What are you talking about? Done with her, man. Tonight really freaked me out. And Spike, you know, who can be, who has his persona, but is actually one of the steelier people I ever worked with, um, super steely. Uh, you're not going to win a lot of arguments with Spike. Um, and it's really better not even to try, but finally I went on so long about it that he went to meet Charlie Sheen, who was, of course, in lockdown. Uh, <laughs> and, of course, he really liked him and came back and he kind of said, okay, you know. You're nuts and let a girl go that calls you Lottie. I'll tell you that as a friend. Charlie, I don't know anything about the girl, man. She could be like a fucking witch or something. That's even better. Hot lesbian witches, think about it, it's fucking genius. The idea was so whacked and so strange, and of course so prescient, because this was really before, what, kind of well before in a way, all the new technologies really uh, became such a massive influence on our lives that really people are in your head and feel like they're entitled to be in your head, yeah. and your head doesn't belong to you. Yeah. Your face doesn't belong to you. Your emails don't belong to you. Uh, nothing belongs to you. It's my head! But I never related it to my life or me. I never thought twice about it, really. And did it change your life, either as an actor or as a public personality? Or I never thought it did as a public personality, but I think in retrospect, what it did change was a kind of introduction of, of a whole different audience and audience age group because that was really the kind of generation Xers. Yeah. And I'm a baby boomer, and that's kids really 20 years younger than me, uh, or, or a little more even. It's a portal and it takes you inside John Malkovich. You see the world through John Malkovich's eyes, and then after about 15 minutes, you're spit out into a ditch on the side of the New Jersey Turnpike. Sounds great. Who the fuck is John Malkovich? And that was their introduction to me, as it were, or to work yeah. that I did. Did you have an increase in the number of people throwing beer cans at you from cars? No, that never could live up to the childhood numbers, but they weren't cans, they were bottles. Or in college, because of various outfits I'd strung together. But um, being John Malkovich, it, it seems to me in my, my experience with it, people my age didn't get it at all, really, yeah. for the most part. I mean, my age now. And younger people really seem to like it very much. Seven and a half, right? Uh, yeah. I'll take you through it. And it seemed to have had a quite an influence in, in the popular culture, uh, at least a certain part of the popular culture, for younger people and, of course, for filmmakers. It, it was very influential, I think. Oh, yeah, well, because it, it made up its a whole new set of rules. Yeah, yeah and refused to diverge from those rules mm -hmm. and made yeah. everyone else bend yeah, around to their them. will. Yeah. yeah, But I think that's really interesting what you said about technology because to some degree it, it felt like, uh, um, you know, I saw it when it came out in a couple of times since and it always feels very present in my mind. Mm -hmm. And then when I went back uh, to watch it again before this interview, suddenly just now I started to notice, oh, this, is a, this was made a decade ago. The cell phones are bigger. The computer mm -hmm. screens are not flat. Mm -hmm. There isn't a ton of internet in this film. Mm -hmm. And um, and as you say, there is a, a perception of privacy that mm -hmm. kind of no longer exists. Doesn't exist at for all. For celebrities at any level, and then no matter, no amount of anonymity 
or a celebrity will protect you from people coming no, to your hand. No, the, the, the private, forget it. Mr. John Malkovich? Yeah, he's calling. And I, I find that unfortunate and disturbing, but then people adjust. I mean, you know, because you can't, you can't go back. And that, I think, was super prescient, as I said, and super clever of Charlie. And what, what he visualized as a nightmare, mm -hmm. both for me and for the public at large, because, say, the scene in the restaurant of Malkovich, 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 of course, that's a... That's a, a a reflection of, of any, especially any performer's uh, somewhat egregious sense of narcissism. So it might be my per personal nightmare. Malkovich. Malkovich, Malkovich. It also has to do with how society also is inundated with all the blah, blah, blah about somebody, you know, and you're constantly, even if you have no feelings about someone, and, and I'm not someone who would ever have feelings about a, quote, celebrity that I didn't have some kind of personal experience with, I, I don't care what they do. I don't care who they are. They don't interest me, but I certainly don't dislike them. Right. It's just not a field of interest. But how also the public is constantly bombarded. Malkovich, Malkovich, Malkovich. That's irritating. Just, it's right. super irritating. And, and if I had to read about me, which I never do, but if I did, I would feel like I'm... You know, as Jack Ruby said, you know, my person, as Don DeLillo said in his book Libra, in the one of my of favorites, Jack Ruby, uh, Jack Ruby said, I personally feel like I've been dropped into a barrel of shit, <laughs> um, and that's yeah. that's how not only I feel about me or my image, but obviously that's what uh, a big part of any public feels about any public figure because they're just sick of it. Yeah, you know. and of course, the what constitutes a public figure now is much more inclusive. Absolutely. So yeah. you know, in in 1999 when the movie came out, you you had you know reality television didn't exist, didn't exist. In, in a meaningful way, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly there was no Facebook, there were no people no, no, no. becoming internet stars, and yes, now sir. you're hearing that many more names being thrown at you yeah, constantly. Um, in, in this weird loop of celebrity mm. endorsement and re-endorsement yeah. and that sort of thing. I, I think Charlie's script was very much a harbinger of things to come. I mean, in many ways, it, 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 uh, it isn't a movie about celebrity per se. It is more about just being someone else. You get to be John Malkovich for 15 minutes. What are the people lining up for in in that little <clears throat> short set room? You know, the seven and a half floor. You know, they're they're not they're not all big John Malkovich fans. That's right. They just want not to be all. something else. It's the same people who take your picture, who you know probably about a thousand times a day. If I'm in public, maybe five thousand some days. It depends. There's always a guy who wants a picture and he wants to go like this. Yeah. Yeah. What is wrong with you? I mean, what do you... Because you're nothing but a monkey or a peanut or a figure at a zoo or, or a, a photo uh, op. Uh, or a trading card. Yeah, a trading card. But of course they're not fans, quote. Because fans maybe wouldn't even ever come over and say hello. You're, you're brilliant. You see, Maxine, it isn't just playing with dolls. Oh, my darling, it's so much more. It's playing with people. I agree that it's not really about celebrity and it's certainly not really about me. Stay in him forever. It's about this idea, I think, that people have that life 
should be better, richer, more thrilling, more fascinating, more worthy of living, uh, etc. And so they'll go into someone's head who supposedly has an interesting life or interesting thoughts in his head. Right, and that even though in the world in the world of the film, there's this running joke about you know he was the guy who was the jewel thief in that movie, and of course they don't even know who you are, man. right? And of course that's really funny. I yeah. think you're really uh, great in that movie oh. when you play that retard. You know, I've had people walk up and ask me, "What film yeah, yeah. have you been in?" Like you're gonna stand there to a complete stranger and cite your resume, and they don't understand that they're sort of hundreds of them or thousands of them or millions and they're one of you yeah and you're just trying to and for that moment they are you know, climbing into your head they're taking that's over right. a part of your head that's that right time, yeah. and your time and your personal space and your hygienic life right, right. and whatever but you can't do anything it's the way it is yeah yeah you understand I set this all up just to hang out with you, right? This is not really funny. Uh, that wasn't my understanding. No, no, no. And I will want pictures later, guys. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah, thank uh, you. <laughs> then there's the really harrowing scene in the film, which, curiously, I had kind of blocked out since the last time I saw it, when, uh, when Maxine and Lottie are running through your subconscious. Mm -hmm. And there are lots and lots of scenes of young John Malkovich being humiliated and abused in different ways. I know Spike likes to beat up on people. It's amusing to him mm -hmm. uh, to torture people in a friendly way. Was, mm -hmm. was that a creation of your subconscious or of his imagination and Charlie's imagination of your subconscious? I think subconscious Charlie's or? imagination and Spike's interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, because I thought they were all the kind of humiliations most of us feel mm -hmm. or imagine. And of course, in the film, it, it also just serves to remind that this person that everyone is lining up to get into the head of is in many ways no different than, it's just you know, has like the same them. awful feelings that they, that of they course, do. Of course, yeah. 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 I think all people have that and have that happen to them or or have a great, great pronounced horror of that. And, you know, I, I think it's very normal and f quite funny, obviously, and it's one of the many things, I think, that give that film such, a, such an edge. Yeah, uh, there's the truth and there are lies, and uh, art always tells the truth, e even when it's lying. The enigmatic John Malkovich, one of the world's greatest entertainers. As we've been discussing, celebrity has changed in our culture. Is there a, a figure that you think would be equivalent or more suitable? Who would the John Malkovich be today? I think now the element of confessional is so pronounced. Yeah. I don't know if you could do it now. Yeah. I was showing a couple of kids on the movie I was doing a month ago or so up in Montreal. Some funny stuff on the internet. There's a woman uh, who's sitting on the toilet and she does the thing, sitting on a toilet. Sitting on a toilet. Sitting on the toilet. Uh, <laughs> goes on for three minutes. And that's, I mean, and it just then it's over. that's it. Yeah, you know. Uh, yeah. And then I, I, if if memory I'm not serves, sure that she, film could have been made if not for the precedent of being John Malkovich. That's right. Uh, and then she flushes. But um, it, it, it strikes me that everything is so confessional yeah. now, and of course. Only the greatest artist could make the confessional true, because once mm -hmm. it becomes public, it, there's, by definition, an element of falsity to it. So I don't know if you could even do it now, because isn't that what Twitter, Twitter, Facebook, right. um, 
all these efforts to make ourselves known as if that if that possibility existed right even to ourselves or for ourselves to to make oneself known yeah Oh, I don't think that's possible. Well, and it's true, you know, and not just in the sense of getting into a, a celebrity's mind, but simply becoming someone else, you can create a persona that is as real course, yeah. sure. all over the world, no matter how false it is in your living room or your, of course, or yeah. your office now. Yeah, sure. So I suppose you're right that the fantasy of climbing through a little door, getting covered with goo, and then being dumped... The New Jersey Turnpike would seem awfully inconvenient today when you can get almost all that experience. Absolutely. But it, does, it is a question of what would you put yourself through in order to spend just 15 minutes inside John Malkovich's head. Mm -hmm. Like one of the things that I thought was interesting about the movie that really struck me again, or I should say for the first time, was the elision of all the time it takes to get from the New Jersey Turnpike back to Manhattan every time Mm -hmm. They go through this experience. That the mm -hmm. experience is so the experience of celebrity or being someone else or for Orson Bean being younger or whatever mm -hmm. it is, mm -hmm. you know, is a, 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 such a small such hit a sliver yeah. of a moment, and so much time is spent in line getting to there and then obviously mm -hmm. getting back. And I think that it sort of speaks to our understanding or misunderstanding of of celebrity and you know yeah and i uh, think it to, also speaks to the waste of time jealousy yeah, absolutely. is do you know what i mean and or envy or even you know to me it does have kind of quite a simple message in a certain way yeah. which is be who you are yeah uh just be who you are and don't worry about what other people do or who they are, be who you are. And, you know, obviously a lot of people don't like being that. I mean, they don't find it fulfilling or entertaining or amusing or challenging, I don't know.